This is Duke University. Uh, my name is Chris Timmons. I'm a professor in the economics department and as I said in the introduction, my main focus, my main area of research is in environmental economics. Um, and over the past couple of years, I've gotten much more interested in shale gas development, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, in particular, I'm here to talk about a, an important aspect of shale gas development that has significant impacts on housing markets and local economies. Um, and in particular, I'd like to tell you about how housing markets react to the risk of groundwater contamination and that uh, puts some emphasis on the word risk um, for reasons that I think are apparent after the last couple of talks and um, should become more apparent as I, as I go through my talk today. Um, I'd like to begin as well by noting that my talk is gonna be based on recent research that I've done with colleagues at Resources for the Future in Washington, D.C. and at the Environmental Defense Fund in New York. And if you're interested in more details about our work, you can get them um, by finding this paper. It's available online. Okay. So to start off, I'd like to note that hydraulic fracturing and shale gas development, probably more than any other source of energy, raises a variety of difficult policy questions. And this is because it constitutes a mixed bag of advantages and disadvantages. Um, as we've heard already, some of the most notable advantages include less pollution in particular um, than burning coal, uh, a stable domestic supply of energy, um, the possibility of job creation, as Jesse talked about in the first talk, um, and that's a complicated question when I teach um, the, the employment effects of environmental regulation. We spend a lot of time talking about when creating new jobs is good and when creating new jobs actually creates distortions. Um, so, in particular, that's a benefit in, in periods of economic downturn, which has been the case recently, so I think that that argument has played well. Um, and then finally, uh, there's a large benefit from royalty payments, at least in the U.S., where um, landowners often, but not always, own the rights to their minerals. Um, they can sub receive substantial payments in exchange for um, making their land available. But the impacts of shale gas development are wide-ranging, and there's a number of important disadvantages to take into account as well. So the biggest, or one of the biggest, is probably air pollution, both locally and in terms of greenhouse gases, if um, fugitive methane is not properly contained and captured. Um, locally, there's noise and light pollution, which can be substantial. There's truck traffic and the many costs that come along with that, hauling large quantities of water in and out. Um, and that also brings up the issue of extensive water use in and of itself, um, three to five million gallons of, of fresh water per uh, frack. Um, in states where um, drought is a concern, that can be a, a big issue. But my uh, talk today is gonna focus not on any of those um, concerns per se, but rather on um, one very important one, which I think is the potential for groundwater contamination. And I, again, I highlight the word potential, and um, we'll come back to why, why that's the case in just a few minutes. So this possibility can arise at various points in the hydraulic fracturing uh, and shale gas extraction production process. Um, it, can, it can result from methane leakage from underground formations. Um, those would be the exploding sinks we saw earlier. Um, maybe more worrisome is the potential for escaped uh, fracking fluid and radioactive and highly saline produced water comes back up out of the ground um, after the fracking process is complete that can escape through compromised pipes. Um, and then finally, the potential for improper disposal of that produced water once it's come out of the ground. So there's scope for regulation at all of these phases and it's important to keep that in mind when I get to my conclusions. Okay. So the evidence for actual groundwater contamination, at least from my reading of the literature, is actually pretty scarce, um, although there have been some documented cases. Um, so for instance, there are cases that have been reported to local state agencies. The Associated Press recently ran a story about this. Um, the EPA has identified 
um, contamination from both methane and from fracking fluid in a couple of places around the country. And uh, researchers here at Duke have found evidence in the Nicholas School primarily looking uh, at methane uh, contamination. However, and here's I think the most important thing for my talk that I'd like you to take away, is that whether there is actual evidence of current contamination or not is to some extent irrelevant. The fact that there simply is a concern that water could become contaminated, or let's say currently is contaminated, or an expectation that it might become contaminated in the future is sufficient to cause sometimes significant damages in the housing market and the economy today. Okay? So we see this in impacts on housing prices, which can affect homeowners' wealth and impact communities through their property tax bases. I think that came up in the talk earlier. Even more disturbing, there's evidence suggesting that major uh, lenders, major banks in the US, are pulling out of housing markets that are exposed to fracking and stopping uh, writing mortgages in those communities. And questions have also been raised about the ability of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the big government institutions, to hold mortgages that are exposed to shale gas development. So we just got done with one major housing crisis, and as fracking grows nationally, we could be seeing the seeds of another one growing. So the practical question then is, how big are these impacts on housing markets? And in particular, does the size of the impacts that we're talking about justify potentially costly regulations that would reduce the risk of groundwater contamination and reassure housing markets? So answering these questions is difficult. And in particular, doing so is complicated by the fact that there are many different impacts of shale gas development on housing prices that we have to disentangle. Sorry, we lost a little bit of the formatting there, but I think you'll get the idea. So in order to describe how we do this disentangling, we're first gonna consider the impacts on house prices from the introduction of a new shale gas well. And in particular, I'd like you to consider how those impacts differ with a house's water source. So you'll see on the um, left-hand side here between the exclamation points, um, piped water and groundwater, okay? and then how it differs with distance from the well, which you'll see up top there, I've broken it out by less than 1.5 kilometers and more than 1.5 kilometers. And those are distances that tend to come out of our research as being relevant for the way impacts hit, uh, hit housing markets and hit houses, okay? Now you'll see that there's some overlap, okay, in, in some of these house price impacts, um, but that several only show up at close distances. So for example, um, traffic congestion, road damage, wastewater disposal are gonna be relevant if you're several kilometers away, and they can also be relevant if you're right next door. Noise, light, air pollution, landscape alteration are primarily what we call in economics externalities that would impact very local housing. Now in particular, the impact that we're most interested in for both the paper that I'm discussing and for this talk um, is that which arises from groundwater contamination risk, which you'll see only shows up at close range and only for groundwater dependent houses. So the question is, how do we disentangle all of these different impacts and recover the one that we're most interested in? Okay? The first thing that we're going to do is difference the reactions of housing prices to the introduction of a new well across near and far piped water houses. So in other words, we're gonna difference the effect of adding a well in area B, okay, there up in the um, northeast corner of my table, from that of adding a well in area A, okay, up in my northwest corner. So the highlighted terms in both of those cells on the table, right, are the same, and therefore get differenced away when I difference those impacts. So you can see that I'm starting to peel away the things that I'm not interested in so I can get down to the one that I'm most concerned with. Okay? That difference is going to leave us with only the circled impacts. These are gonna be the impacts on piped water houses located very close 
to drilling operations. Okay. Next, we're going, going to do the same thing, but only using groundwater dependent houses. So in other words, we're going to difference the effect of adding a well in D from that of adding a well in C. And the highlighted terms, again, are, are the same, both near and far. So those impacts are going to difference away. And what we're going to be left with is only the circled impacts, which if you remember um, from a slide or two ago, those circled impacts are the same as the ones we found in the piped water discussion, except they have one crucial thing added in, which is the impact on groundwater households. Okay. Finally, we're going to take the difference between these two differences. In particular, we're going to take areas C minus D in parentheses up in the air, minus areas A minus B, again in parentheses up in the air. Once we do that, accounting for the overlap in impacts in the two circles, we're going to be left with an estimate of the house price impact of just groundwater contamination or the risk of groundwater contamination to be careful about it, okay? So we estimate this model using rich data on housing transactions that we've collected from Pennsylvania and from the bordering counties in New York where there's currently a moratorium on fracking. But those counties provide us with a nice control group, neighborhoods that look similar to neighborhoods in Pennsylvania but where fracking is not legal. Okay. And we combine this with geocoded data on the locations of all wells in Pennsylvania, along with dates on when those wells were spudded, so we know how they relate to the dates of the housing transactions, information about whether those wells were producing or not. Okay, not all wells that get drilled actually go into operation, and importantly, you don't get paid royalties unless there's actually gas coming out. Um, and then finally, we've, we've actually got information about whether the wells are visible from, this, from the centroid of each housing property, which is interesting if you want to check to see if the, the costs we're finding have anything to do with visual disamenities, which they, they, it looks like they do. Okay, so using these techniques, the first thing we do is isolate the impacts on nearby houses that are specific to piped water, house, piped water homes. That would have been the, the circled impacts on, in the northwest corner of my table a few minutes ago. So combining the costs of noise, light, air pollution with the disamenities of landscape alteration and the benefits of lease payments, okay, we find evidence actually of small benefits for those houses that tend to range between 5.7 and 6.6% of value depending upon how far away from the well you are within a kilometer or a little bit more. So that's a net effect, incorporating both disamenities of being nearby something unpleasant and probably getting paid for, for gas coming out of the ground. Okay, finally, we recover the house price impacts attributable to the groundwater contamination risk. These turn out to be large, very large, and negative, ranging between 10% and 22.4% of the house value, depending upon how close you actually are. I want to note that together with the previous results, these results suggest net losses for groundwater dependent properties, actual drops in value associated with having um, these operations come in nearby. And you can get into interesting uh, discussions about game theory between uh, neighbors in terms of why you actually end up seeing drilling happen when it might be uh, a bad idea for everyone involved. Okay. Most importantly though, I'd like to leave you to consider that these results suggest okay, that there may be significant gains to be had from policies designed to reduce groundwater contamination risk and convince housing markets that the water supply in areas of shale gas development is in fact safe. Thank you.